Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this next session. We are with uh, with Lucas uh, uh, from Train, and um, he's going to be talking about, oh, looks like they can see it right on the screen, the hottest HVAC designs for the coldest climates, decarbonizing through ultra-high efficiency electrification. So, Lucas, I'll let you take it away. Maybe give yourself a quick introduction, and, and we'll go from there. Um, we're also going to be doing some a few little polls throughout this throughout it as well so i will publish the polls and if you guys can answer them um and give us some some feedback that'd be great and there also is a, a chat function as well anytime ask questions in the chat and i'll make sure uh, those questions get to lucas so take it away lucas perfect thanks mark uh you can throw the first question up there so people have a chance to look at it while i'm getting started here as well uh so name's lucas glossville good to meet everybody uh, really hoping to feel free to ask questions and, and have a bit more of a discussion here today, but going to talk about uh, a large array of different items regarding cold climate decarbonization, different heat pump technologies that are here now. The industry is changing really rapidly and uh, really the manufacturers are on the forefront of developing new technologies to meet uh, the expectations and, and uh, the goals uh, moving towards a, a greener climate and, and less carbon in the systems that we work on. So hopefully it's an informative session, but really feel free to ask questions and, and happy to answer those or, or keep moving forward. Uh, do answer the questions if you don't mind. There's a couple of polls that'll help kind of tailor the presentation to yourselves as well and uh, good feedback for, for us as well and uh, what we should spend a little more time on and, and things like that. So uh, Mark, I will get you to give me an answer on question one and a couple of slides, uh, just kind of uh, who's, who's answered which kind of thing. So. Uh, Jumping so which, in, yeah, which, go ahead. Which question? So I just had a quick question. question. Number, yeah, yeah. No, number question one. number one on scope one, two, and three. Uh, yeah. So that one, yeah. Well, okay. So that one I did publish. We have a little bit of response for that uh, right now. Perfect. 25% uh, said yes, absolutely. And 75% said, what is this guy talking about? So um, cool. There you go. That Awesome. Appreciate it. If that changes a lot, let me know, but we'll go with that for now. Um, one thing I always like to just kind of have an example slide here and, and really when you're working with different uh, companies, I think it's really important to look at not just kind of the product that they're they're putting out there, but really like what they're standing behind. I've uh, been finding a lot of like the end clients, uh, especially for uh, buildings in the market are looking towards ES and G all the way through their supply chain. So it's not just yourselves. Who are working with your clients but it's also the vendors and and people that and partners that, that you work with so making sure that the people you work with meet the expectations of your clients and getting that information up front highly recommend uh and and make sure that they're meeting kind of the goals that you as a company are trying to meet as well as your clients goals uh and this is an example of train but every company hopefully has set uh out goals at this point uh to meet different environmental social or, or their governance goals and uh, I'm proud to work for the company I do for uh, the goals that they've set out and, and really push the envelope on, on doing as much as they can. Uh, in HVAC, uh, at least from a train perspective, we, we look at kind of four pillars in decarbonizing buildings uh, and really across our portfolio, even outside of buildings and looking at transport and, and, and other ways that we do heating and cooling systems. Uh, but we really see energy efficiency as a big pillar, electrification, uh, renewable energy and refrigerant management. And that's where all of our solutions and, and how we approach problem solving comes from. So as you can see in the slide here, really focusing on being able to improve energy efficiency is, is absolutely critical. Moving from fossil fuels to electric sources, often heat pump technologies is where we can get the highest efficiency. Uh, and then as we look at where do we get the electricity from, as we know in Canada, we have some grids that are extremely clean, uh, some of the best in the world. And then we have uh, some areas specific or regions that are not as green. And so how do we make sure that we're using the right solutions in the right markets and the right regions to make sure that we're getting the best, uh, I guess, bang for your buck from a decarbonization perspective, uh, especially when you work with large portfolio managers that have buildings across Canada or across the world. Uh, and then also looking at using renewable energy where it makes sense as well, directly on site and, and things like that, or working with providers that can provide renewable energy. And then refrigerant management has been important in the industry for, for uh, many decades now, but it's uh, now more than ever, we're continuing to make better quality refrigerants and make sure that we have refrigerants that 
have a reduced greenhouse warming potential, so the GWP. And I'll mention that in a, in a later slide as well. But whereas previously we were looking at ODP, which is ozone depletion potential, uh, we now are really making sure we focus on GWP and uh, making sure all the manufacturers have the best greenhouse warming potential for each of their different types of products. And you'll see that a lot of things are changing really rapidly from the refrigerant standpoint to make sure that those new requirements are met. Uh, and manufacturers pushing beyond that to make sure you have the lowest GWP or greenhouse warming potential options that are available. So we had 25% roughly that uh, were like, what the heck are you talking about? So I'll do a, a high level and highly recommend that you maybe do a quick Google as well if you're not very familiar uh, with different scopes. So when we look at decarbonizing, uh, whether it's a building or anything else in our lives uh, or in the on your organization as well, we look at three different scopes. So I'm going to focus on describing it as kind of a from a building perspective, but you can see as an example in the slide here, uh, a scope one could be your fleet uh, as well as a cars or, or things you're using directly uh, or trucks if you got them on the road, if you're a contractor, for example. Uh, for a scope one for a building owner, we're seeing fuels that are burned on site. So it's direct emissions that are created on site. So a good example is if you have a boiler or a furnace or a rooftop unit with a gas heater, anything that's burning fuel on site and creating emissions or CO2, uh, methane, other carbon emissions, those emissions are scope one for that building owner or the person that's, that's working on that site now or, or uh, has that site. For scope two, it's one level removed. So a great example is the energy or electricity that is purchased or brought to the site to then be used. So for example, building again is our example, uh, electricity for lighting, for heating, for refrigeration, to cool things, uh, everything that uses the electricity, that electricity is a scope to emission because that electricity is being made by something downstream offsite somewhere else. Scope three can be a little bit harder sometimes uh, to look at. And the best way to think about it is often through embodied carbon. So embodied carbon means that you have carbon that's been created or carbon emissions that have been created to create the product or, or item that, you, that you're looking at. So uh, best way to think about it is everything, if you're sitting in a building right now, or you have a laptop in front of you right now, everything around you and that you're touching or looking at all took some amount of carbon to create. And so we need to use a desk and we need to use a computer. We need to use, uh, have walls with gypsum board and, and wood and flooring with carpets, et cetera. But all those things have a uh, carbon emission to them. And that's all part of your scope three. So when a building owner purchases a product from us, for example, like an HVAC product, they would, Hey, Lucas, you froze on me. I don't know if it's happening to anyone else, um, but you're frozen for three, one or two. So if something is someone's scope three, it's someone else's scope one or two. And so everything becomes integrated when you start to look at your scope. So Lucas, can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna try to get a hold of Lucas and I don't know what's happening, but he is uh, frozen from what I can tell. Um, I'm assuming it's the same for-, for us. How are we doing? Are we back? Oh, you're back now, yeah. All right, I moved from Wi-Fi to my phone. Not sure why the Wi-Fi cut out here, just in the office, but uh, my apologies. I will jump back to the deck. Where did I lose you? Kind of, you were d talking about scope three um, is, is where Perfect. you started to uh, go away. 
Okay, so scope three, just to get back to it, is someone else's scope one or two. And uh, really it's it's the embodied carbon often, the best way to think about it is uh, things that you're not controlled directly yourself, but you can ask someone else to control for. So if you purchased a HVAC product, for example, uh, you can look into and ask your suppliers to make sure that it has a reduced scope one or two for them, which would then uh, be a reduced scope three for yourselves. And so that's what brings it full circle. If, uh, if everyone's looking at their scope one and two, then scope three will be controlled through there. Uh, but for now, a lot of organizations are looking at all three scopes so that they can measure it and then go to their suppliers and their vendors and everything to ask them to improve the scope three, which would be those vendors scope one or two. Okay, so uh, give me a heads up if uh, if we're if we're good here, Mark. Right now, perfect. So uh, jumping to kind of high level on a heat pump, this is just an example slide of uh, how one general type of heat pump works. This is an air to water heat pump, and you might be familiar with this either as a heat pump or looking as an air cooled chiller. Uh, and really the when we look at the definition of what a heat pump is, it's a, a unit that's able to actually switch between heating and cooling. So the evaporator and condenser switch roles by reversing the actual flow of the refrigerant going through the circuit. And we can have many sizes and types, et cetera. But really the example here, if you look in the bottom of the screen, you have what we would know as, an, uh, sorry, uh, if you look at the top of the screen, apologies, You'd have what we'd know as, a, as an air-cooled chiller. We're taking in hot air. We're heating up that air more and rejecting it out to the outside space. And with that heat rejection, we're creating colder water. And we can send that cooling to, to the building, for example, or to an industrial source. And when we're looking at that same piece of equipment, when it's in heat pump mode, we're taking in cold air. That's the bottom picture now. And we're putting that up and get, sending it even colder uh, and we're basically taking that heat out of the outside air and, and pulling it and now boosting that with the heat pump to a high temperature or whatever temperature we need to provide heating to the building. So that same piece of equipment can provide heating or cooling. And I'll show some examples of things that uh, can do both simultaneously and in different configurations. Uh, and then we also see a lot of heat recovery units being called heat pumps in the industry. Uh, there's a little bit of confusion around kind of naming conventions, I would say, but normally a re reversing valve would be a, a standard heat pump, but we see a lot of heat recovery units that do high temperature heating that uh, you may have a client or, or yourselves mentioning it as a, as a heat pump as well. Just some examples of heat pumps. Uh, a lot of this might be information that uh, people know, but just for those that might have that information. Uh, I'll go through just the different types of heat pumps just as an educational. Mark, while I'm doing that, if you want to turn on the second question, that would be on the commercial heat pumps or chillers day to day uh, and let people answer that as well while we're, while we're going through. And then I'll ask you how that turned out in a few slides. All right. So, uh, so perfect. Air to air uh, is a pretty straightforward. A lot of people might know it as a VRF system or a mini split system in a residential uh, home, for example, or a lot of apartment complexes are getting small mini splits now as well to decarbonize. And so what you might uh, see is that is really the heat moving from the conditioned space in the building and cooling mode and, and pulling it out of the building and, and rejecting it to the air. And then in the winter, pulling that heat out of the outside air and, and putting it into the conditioned space or the, or the building. So very easy, switches back and forth uh, with the reversing valve uh, in that heat pump there. Water to air, uh, we do the same thing, but now your outside air turns to uh, a water source. So you have a condenser loop in the building and you're rejecting heat to it and pulling heat from it to condition the space as you need. Water source heat pumps are very common in a lot of condos uh, as well as uh, a lot of offices and, and things like that have water source heat pumps as well. Air to water is the one I just showed you on the last slide. So that is rejecting heat and pulling heat from the air itself and sending it to water. And that water would then be pumped throughout the building or for an industrial process for heating or cooling. And then 
Uh, water to water is where we see both heat rejection coming to and from uh, water sources, maybe separate water sources, one uh, in one place and another in another place. A uh, most common standard unit that we would think of is like a chiller, uh, which does it for cooling, but you can also do heat recovery with uh, these units. And you can also have heat recovery uh, heat pumps that do have a reversing valve there and they can actually switch back and forth as well. But often we see standard four pipe units uh, as very commonly called heat pumps as well uh, without the reversing valve. Quick slide on embodied carbon. Uh, really what uh, I think it's important to kind of just frame and perspective. And, and I, it was a great slide when I first saw it many years ago now. And I uh, just want to touch on it because I think it brings light to something I'll show on the next slide. So this is an example as a, as a hydronic heat pump chiller uh, or a heat recovery chiller. And what uh, we're really showing here is that we did an energy uh, analysis or an environmental product declaration, which looks at carbon and, and energy that are used for the production of a unit. And as you can see here, the largest blue section, the dark blue is really the raw materials. So when we look at the embodied carbon or the carbon that's in that unit, we can actually see that a lot of it comes from steel and copper and a little bit from aluminum uh, in a chiller. If you're familiar with chillers, that you would uh, assume that probably as well. And then on the left, the larger items that we have on the left are manufacturing and the red uh, uses a lot of energy to form that steel and that copper and, and make it what it needs to be. R roughly 1% for transport. And then uh, the other two large carbon emitters is really the leakage and the charge. So when refrigerant is created from the place that it's made all the way to when it's put into the unit and the entire life cycle of the unit, there's often risks of, of leakage all the way through right till the end of life of the unit. And so we need to account for the embodied carbon of that refrigerant if there's a potential for it leaking throughout its life. And so when we look at that, even after leaves our, our factory, for example, we want to make sure that on site you're accounting for that too. So this is using standard third party data as well as understanding when the when they manufacture refrigerant, any waste or anything that might happen there and uh, accounts for that entirety. On the charge portion, the 13%, theoretically, as long as you don't have that leakage, that is part of your recovery. Uh, and you could break that down once the chiller is at end of life and needs to be replaced. You could vacuum that charge out and uh, and either use it in another piece of equipment or safely destroy it. Disposal is at about 0% just because it rounds down. Uh, and that uh, it is so low just because a chiller like that is very recyclable. Uh, most of the of the products are recyclable and, and don't require any carbon really to dispose of it. One interesting part of that and what I want to touch on is really looking from the perspective here of the grid, we look at the embodied carbon versus the operational carbon. So, and this is something that I found really important as we move from 2010 to 2020, uh, just as an example, we actually saw embodied carbon reduce, uh, sorry, embodied carbon increase on equipment and operational carbon uh, that was reduced. And so it's often people thinking like, oh, why is the embodied carbon to manufacture or make this equipment going up? And the interesting thing is actually it's going, uh, it's actually going down, but what is improving at a faster rate in looking at it completely is that the operational carbon, or in this case, chillers use electricity, is actually going down. So what that means is that as uh, we start to green our grids and improve, if you look in the bottom, you can see operational carbon uh, emissions here in metric tons, 40, and then, and then 27, 20. What we see is that operationally, it's getting a lot more clean to run this equipment on average. And that is not just in clean grids and dirty grids, it's just on average across everything. And so what we're really seeing is that across the, the board in North America, grids are getting cleaner and cleaner as we see more renewables and, uh, and other green um, uh, infrastructure being put in place. This is a interesting slide as well. I think you might be interested in, in taking a look at it. 
uh, I, I've always thought it fascinating just to shift perspective. Uh, so along the bottom, you'll see different examples of, of rooftop units. These are just names of different sizes of, of rooftop unit, but uh, less so what exactly those names are and more on aggregate is what we're looking at on this slide. So when we looked at our rooftop units and had a third party review of the carbon emissions from them, uh, we looked at efficiency improvement, refrigerant change, and conversion of gas heat to heat pump heating. And when we looked at that for our rooftop units, we saw that as we improve the efficiency, even from the standard uh, efficiency unit that we like would meet code, moving to the most efficient unit, in the total lifespan of the unit, the amount of CO2 savings was only around 3% or a million tons annually that we were looking at, which isn't a huge change in CO2. We might have an increased efficiency, reduced electricity, et cetera, which is great, saves money on the operational side, but it doesn't use as much carbon. Uh, or it doesn't have as much reduction in carbon, uh, which is what we're aiming for when we do GHG or greenhouse gas uh, reductions. So uh, looking at refrigerants, we found that even the, right now we're switching, for example, uh, from 410A to R454B, and, and trains mostly made that switch completely now by the end of the year, uh, everything will be switched over. And we found that there is a huge reduction in GWP moving from 410A to 454B. 454B is actually about a fifth, like 20% of what 410A is on the GWP scale. But still, because there's so little refrigerant in comparison to the amount of carbon made in other ways, it was still, again, about 3% million tons equivalent. So even with that great improvement in refrigerant, which is absolutely critical and necessary, it still doesn't make a huge dent. So we're at 6%. Uh, and really, the, the large elephant in the room or the, the idea of actually reducing and having a big impact on GHGs is that last one. So really where we're, we're using the most greenhouse gas uh, and, and producing it the most is when we're burning usually natural gas as a fuel. Uh, obviously, if there's oil or, uh, or other carbon sources that are coal, for example, that we're using, uh, that would be in addition to this. But generally, our heat pump uh, and rooftop units all that have gas heat or have heating additional in addition to the heat pump or not having a heat pump all use natural gas. And when we look at natural gas, if we can actually reduce uh, by 20%. So if we can convert 20% of the existing rooftop units to gas heat, uh, that's gas heat right now to heat pumps, that 20% creates a 16% reduction in CO2 equivalents. So pretty much the entirety of the other uh, percentages that are uh, looking in the reduction is all the heating. And that's because we're burning gas, which creates carbon, and then uh, if we're not doing that and using a heat pump, we're using electricity instead. So really the key benefit is switching from gas heat to heat pump, or even looking at dual fuel units where you have the gas heat backup still for those peak or those coldest days. And we're using heat pumps for the seasonal where it's the most economical operation wise. And uh, it's also reducing the amount of electrical load on the building, which uh, is a key benefit, as we know, as it gets colder, because uh, we're starting to see more electricity use in the winter, whereas peaks generally uh, have been in the summer because of cooling loads in the past. So one slide just to show you an example, uh, and it's not really like, I mean, this is some of our products kind of thing, but it doesn't really like I wouldn't look at the exact names of products and just more look at the pictures. What I want to show with this slide is that Heat pumps can look really like any size, shape, uh, et cetera. And, and we see heat pump technologies in a lot of different types of equipment, whether they're rooftops, VRF systems, uh, chillers, uh, air handling units, uh, terminal devices of all kinds. Heat pump technology is, is through and through across uh, many different types of HVAC. And so really important to kind of see that. And when someone says, hey, I'm putting a heat pump in or I want a heat pump, it doesn't mean some specific type of unit, right? It, you want to first figure out exactly what they need, and then you can make that a heat pump uh, from there, but pick the right unit for the project. 
So, Mark, how did uh, you get with question two? Question two, it was like if, uh, yes, it was one third uh, do it, two thirds not. Cool. Okay, great. Uh, let's put up the third question. My clients are asking me questions about how to decarbonize their buildings. Yep. So this one is uh, if your clients ask you or not, just more curious um, what you're normally normally seeing right now. So looking at uh, when we at heat pumps and, and, and looking at hot water, and this uh, might be more for people that are looking at it day to day versus not, but it's uh, a key benefit and good rule of thumb to remember and kind of one of the most important things that, that I talk to when we when we talk about projects is get the temperature as low as you can uh, in the heating loop. So as an example, when you have a hot water system with boilers, a lot of boilers are running at uh, about 82 Celsius or, or 180 Fahrenheit, some running slightly lower, maybe 160, uh, excuse me. But what you really wanna see is as we move to heat pumps, the efficiency of a boiler is kind of standardized around that 180 or 160. And if you have condensing boilers, maybe 140, but an efficiency of a heat pump is much better at lower temperatures. So we can get less electricity use for the same amount of heating capacity. If we can get to lower temperatures. So what we often recommend is that you try and get as close to hundred degrees or 105 degrees Fahrenheit hot water in your buildings as you can. And that might sound crazy low uh, to many people if they're used to using 180, but really uh, we have many, many, many buildings that we see that are, that are designed around that now. And uh, a lot of even existing buildings uh, that have been retrofitted with new coils, et cetera, to get to these lower temperatures. And when you look at it, you have a roughly 1% penalty in efficiency or COP for every 1% above 105 Fahrenheit. So we really want to make sure that we're keeping the, uh, the temperature as low as possible to increase the efficiency of the system. <clears throat> Here's an example uh, just to show, because there's uh, always uh, kind of someone thinking in the back of their mind, like, hey, if I'm running at like 100 degrees or 105 degrees, my system's not going to be able to work at that low temperature. And so we did a study actually on hot water supply temperatures. Uh, for different types of equipment and what their kind of minimum hot water temperature, while you can still maintain the space in the coldest temperatures outside, uh, what we would expect. And these are those it, uh, and the findings from the study. And it is very valuable information to understand uh, and see and, and work with because it can reset in a lot. I mean, it did in mine, a lot of our, a lot of our brains saying, Hey, you know what? We don't need to design in a 120, 140 or anything like that. We can bring it down to 105 or 110 or 100 degrees. And I've been in buildings that are 40 years old that have 110 degree hot water supply uh, going through the building, heat recovery units, et cetera. And, uh, and some of the coldest places, like I was in one in Winnipeg, uh, where it's minus 40 consistently outside. And, and uh, they're heating the whole building for the last 40 years with 110. So a uh, commercial size building and, and, and no issues. So it's definitely possible. And there's lots of examples. That's just one of them. Uh, and uh, lots of people have been doing it for a long time. So this is uh, a good slide to kind of think about a little bit. Uh, when you're starting to decarbonize your building or, or looking at decarbonizing, we want to figure out where we're going to get the heat. Step one, always, we need to get heat from somewhere because it's important to know that <clears throat> heat pumps, the same way electric resistance heating does or electric boiler, they actually move heat from one place to another. The benefit of that is that you can have efficiencies that are significantly higher than, than gas or electric boilers. For example, a gas unit might have a COP or an efficiency kind of 85 to 95% maybe with the condensing boiler, but uh, electric boilers would have hundred percent efficiency because all the electricity turns to heat. Uh, but heat pumps can get into the 300%, 500%, 600% uh, efficiency or COPs kind of up in the, the three, five, six. And really that's because they're moving heat from a place that is warm or more efficient 
and they're moving into a higher temperature. And as we reduce that difference, the lift, which is the difference between where you're getting the heat, the source, and where you're supplying it, you're building. If you can make that difference as small as possible by reducing your building temperature that you need, the loop hot water temperature down as much as you can, and then finding higher, warmer places to pull heat from, you can get really, really high CLPs and really high efficiency, which have great operational paybacks uh, and are really, really smart projects to do. <clears throat> so places to get heat are on the on the slide here. Uh, take a quick read through. I don't need to read through them, but while we're maybe you want to let us for uh, the decarbonizing the buildings question. Yeah, we're right at 50 50, which is a little surprise. I thought it would be actually higher, but uh, I'm sure everyone's looking how they can save money, but uh, maybe less so about decarbonization, right? So, yeah, for sure. So, I, I've definitely noticed that uh, some people or some building owners say, hey, decarbonizing is going to be more expensive than not decarbonizing. And, uh, and, and when we look at money, in some cases, that can be true. But if you look at life cycle of the building, life cycle of the equipment, uh, we have a lot of examples where it's actually cheaper to pay a bit more up front and get really good paybacks on decarbonizing. Not usually 100% decarbonization of a building, but reducing your carbon by maybe 50%, 60%. It's good for the environment and very good for the pocketbook as well. So definitely uh, something to kind of bring up is like, hey, I can save you money over the next 20 years. And uh, you can also uh, meet your your uh, your goals of, of becoming a more environmentally conscious kind of client as well. Perfect. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, I said that's great. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Uh, okay, so jumping into energy here. Uh, energy can be kind of types of places. And uh, in the past, we've always taken stored energy. So we think coal, oil, gas, biomass, wood, uh, any of these places, it's all stored energy, right? So you can move it really easy to transport, really easy to store, use it as you need it, as you need it. But the electricity, you can't do that, right? It's instantaneous. So if we make electricity at a coal fired power plant or a hydro generating station or a windmill or a solar panel, that electricity is generated right now and has to be used on the grid right now. And so we really need to think about as we move to more green solutions in the market and green and, and everyone's moving towards uh, greener grids and everything. When we don't have that clean energy being generated, we need to get it from somewhere. So uh, depending on where you are, there's a lot of peaking plants or, or plants that are fueled stored energy that are being used to kind of meet that demand right now. But what we're also seeing is a huge increase in storing energy behind the meter on site. So buying uh, or using the electricity when it's cheaper and when it gets really expensive, like a GA day or a time of use time when the electricity is expensive, you can then use it behind the meter. Uh, and really that storage in quotations is in or around the building or on the building property. So some common storage places uh, most people think of is like a battery. Um, there's some obvious like pros and cons to that. Um, pros being it's electricity stored right there, cons being cost and, uh, and also the risk of kind of having a lot of batteries on site uh, as well as kind of the longevity of, of, of having lithium ion battery as an example. And then the other big way to store energy is in heating or cooling systems. And that's what we specialize in. So we talk uh, through that a lot. You can do that as a, a big storage, like a pool of water, for example, um, or a large lake or pond uh, where you can heat or cool that and manage that temperature. Uh, or you can use it in more modular form, which we work with a lot. Um, so in the bottom of this slide, the example is, it says TES, those are thermal energy. And, uh, those are kind of the size, like two fit in a parking space kind of, kind of thing. And they're about eight feet tall. And those are more modular systems. So we use them a lot to store energy, uh, throughout. And we actually use them as a phase change material. So we use water, uh, or turning to ice, which 
can create a, a phase change of that with a clean material, no waxes or oils or anything like that, uh, or uh, anything that isn't easily replaceable. It's all just water that's freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing. And we can do that because of the phase change in a very small compact space, get a lot of energy out of a small compact space. And so in this example, uh, I'm just going to show kind of a system design of what it could look like using thermal energy. And, and this is what we're seeing is a lot of organizations are moving towards uh, using storage as part of their system. So as an example, building system, most buildings are fairly similarly set up and you can use thermal energy in different ways, but I don't have six hours to go through it all. So happy to just go through this to now and then can talk through other options if people have questions, but cooling uh, there's always a, a kind of cooling load either simultaneously or different times of the year. There's a heating load. Uh, in this case, we need to add to the system heating or cooling. So we're using air to water heat pump. AWHP is air to water heat pump. And we're adding heat like a boiler kind of thing when it's cold outside, if, if we need it. And then we're rejecting heat when it's too hot outside, like, uh, we want to cool the building, for example. And so that is kind of keeping the system loop uh, in balance. The last thing is using <clears throat> the intermediate loop or the or this energy storage where we're actually able to store that energy and use it at different times. So we can pull heat from there or we can send heat to there to manage the building. Sometimes you might look at, uh, if you have a large summer load, for example, cooling load, we might add a cooling tower to this design uh, and not just reject to heating coils, but reject to the cooling tower for additional cooling uh, in the in the summer instead of using the air to water heat pump. <clears throat> so looking at cooling, uh, kind of going through a couple modes, you might use the air to water heat pump for cooling directly. You might use your storage tanks for cooling directly. In that case, you're not using any equipment at all. You're just using that ice and running your pump. So very li little electricity load. It's really good when we start to look at uh, GA days and, and times in the summer when it's really, uh, the electricity needs to be reduced as much as possible using the energy storage. It can save a lot of money. There's a lot of incentives for that. Uh, you can use both ice and the air to water heat pump simultaneously. And we do that a lot in the different modes uh, at night, maybe when, or when electricity is cheaper, we would then charge those tanks for the next day and make them cold again. So we can throughout the uh, throughout the the next day we can have cooling again. Now, as we move towards heating, whether it's the shoulder seasons where we might need to cool uh, in the later in the afternoon and then heat maybe in the early morning for morning warm up or at night, we can now pull that energy from the phase change uh, water slash ice tanks, freeze the tanks and heat the building. Uh, we use a water to water heat pump for that or a chiller heater. If you have some cooling simultaneously, you can also pull that heat directly and, uh, and do direct heat recovery or use uh, the tanks and the reclaimed heat as well at the same time. So we're able to use many configurations and yeah, looking at pulling the cooling at the same time as the energy storage allows for us to heat buildings the most efficiently. You can also use kind of the, what I showed a second ago is the free cooling uh, next day. So now once uh, looking at this slide, like in a seasonal aspect, we're pulling as much heat and we're kind of freezing the tanks and, and cooling that we're pulling that heat and putting it into the building. Instead of doing air to air heat recovery and throwing that heat outside, we can, or that cooling outside, we can actually now do, we can store that and use it later in the day or the next kind of evening uh, to make sure that, when, or the next morning when you, when you need that uh, extra heating, we can take that heating, do it then, and then later in the afternoon, you can do cooling. And so that would be then pulling again, no chillers needing to run, no additional cooling, DX cooling or anything. It's just running the pumps uh, to, to pull that cool over to the cooling coils from the from the thermal tanks. So uh, these are some kind of benefits of reclaiming heat, but heat recovery is pretty standard as a knowing like that if you're able to recover heat, it's a lot more efficient than making heat. Uh, and it's also a lot cooling side too. So we use these systems a lot and uh, a lot of uh, 
different people in the industry use use uh, tanks as well, and and uh, especially phase change uh, for efficient space use as well. Uh, so looking at kind of uh, heating for storage, we often add heat to uh, the tanks kind of thing, and then we can control the entire system. So often like control can be important. Uh, there's like a system level controller usually that is controlling this entire system and deciding, hey, the air to water heat pump should turn on now because of the temperature and then because of the grid requirements. And then the tanks uh, should be pulled, should have heat added to them or heat removed from them and frozen at different times as well and providing that heat to the distribution loop. Uh, sometimes when we look at designs, you might add a trickle heater, like a little electric boiler or a gas boiler to add additional heat into the system in the winter. If you're not able to fully meet the loads, depending on the design, uh, I would say a lot of designs in Canada have, uh, have a small trickle heater at least added, and that would just add a small amount of heat into the system at a uh, pretty low temperature just to maintain that, uh, that heat added so that the tanks never uh, freeze and they're able to continuously provide heat to the building. Uh, yeah, some challenges uh, and, and kind of looking at how to best do them. Uh, thermal balancing is really important. Space and for heat temps, uh, heat pumps outside is really important. And then looking at uh, using like colder climate units that can manage the temperature and then having storage as needed as well. Sometimes uh, we look at different backup systems or having enough tanks to get through a colder period as well if we use a less uh, cold climate heat pump as well. There's a lot of different ways to look at it. Um, and really like we usually work with our clients or, or other manufacturers like us work with the clients to make sure you have the right solutions to meet the expectations as well as your requirements for the, for the buildings. Um, we also have electrical demand, which saves a lot of, uh, kilowatts, for example, and energy, and there's a lot of rebates involved and, uh, also the tax credits that have come out from the government as well, a 30% tax credit. Or thermal storage is quite common, uh, can be used across this as well. Um, <clears throat> if you have questions, though, let me know. Uh, I guess last one, Mark, uh, or the next question here, uh, just like, do you work with partners to create solutions instead of just providing products to clients? Uh, curious about that one. All right, I have published it. So, perfect. Please Thank you. Please go and answer. A quick slide on, on rooftops awesome. and happy to answer any questions on them, but standard, uh, we've been seeing a lot of like for like replacements of, of rooftops and, and, or as close to like to like as possible. A lot of dual fuel replacements where the client is taking an existing DX cooling gas heat unit, <clears throat> removing that, removing the electrical gas, taking the unit off the roof, putting a new unit on and reconnecting the gas and the electrical. And the heat pump inside there is sized for the cooling. So it's exact same cooling tonnage uh, and can provide heating for most uh, like the shoulder season and into part of the part of the winter. And then when the heat pump's not able to meet the load, gas heat kicks on and does that uh, the rest of the way. And so we see that very commonly installed. There's, there's many, many of those installed uh, every week or month or in the year. Uh, it's a very common product and there's rebates and things like that for that as well. And then we see, in some cases, uh, electric backup or heat pump only units that we do as well. I would say a little less common than the hybrid or dual fuel units, but definitely picking up steam as well with people looking uh, to move fully electric uh, or have heat pump only. <clears throat> I'm just going to go through some slides uh, specific to different types of equipment and uh, happy to answer questions on them, but I don't necessarily like need to read the slides, uh, but I wanted to show kind of what's out there as examples of types of equipment, more so that uh, you're familiar with them. If you have a client or someone's asking about it. On the air to water side, uh, this is an example packaged unit. Normally we see larger package units instead of modular units for lower, uh, lower cost of, of purchase really, uh, because instead of having a many modular units that are all tied uh, or bolted together, this can come as one unit. So a lot of uh, additional costs. And uh, it's not separate units, like it can't be separated, uh, but it reduces the overall cost of the system quite a bit. And very good for, for uh, if you need an air to water heat pump that can be an air 
well. This is a very common choice up to about 2,500 MDH of heating or two and a half million BTUs and up to 230 tons of cooling at the same time. So not simultaneous, this would be heating or cooling and it would switch over. Uh, you could switch it over every day if you wanted to. And we have systems, for example, what I was showing with the thermal storage where it's switching over even multiple times a day. Um, and uh, it's set up for that uh, as well. So hot water temperature maxes out at about 140 Fahrenheit. But normally we see these systems that running uh, actually lower temperature than that because they're quite a bit more efficient and they can go down to zero Fahrenheit on the low end. Uh, so often we see these uh, adding heat to a thermal storage uh, that we just saw um, kind of maybe around the 70 or 80 degrees because it doesn't need to get that hot and it's super efficient producing lower temperature hot water because you have less lift like we were talking about or difference between the air temperature and the temperature that you're providing. So it's super efficient. Uh, or we might see it heating a building at like 105 to 120 kind of thing. Uh, and, and that's the other kind of heating. And then chilled water is often kind of your standard 40 or 42, 56 kind of thing. Here's a modular unit, uh, very similar, but has a higher lift capability. So it can do more lift at the same time, chilled water and heating. Uh, this is where we're seeing modules now getting stacked together and provided as one unit or as multiple modules. And uh, really very common for uh, modular flexibility. The next one's a multi-pipe unit. So for uh, geo systems, for example, we see a lot of people use this or anywhere where there's a source pipe. So two pipes are for the source where you're getting the heat or cool from. And then you have two pipes for cooling and two pipes for heating, all fully separated heat exchangers. The, the different loops never mix and uh, very efficient system and, and very often used uh, in kind of designs that have a source loop. For example, a good example is geo. Uh, looking at kind of bigger equipment for those that, that work on larger systems, energy systems, for example, uh, where we're looking at large centrifugal chiller, for those not familiar, and that centrifugal unit can produce 180 Fahrenheit hot water. And that's you can also set up in six pipes, say 180 going off of one set of pipes and 140 coming off another set of pipes, for example. And, uh, and really that benefit provides heating throughout uh, from like large district or university campus or uh, any kind of, even like large buildings, hospitals are very common. Uh, we're doing a lot of these types of projects. And then it provides chilled water down about 38 Fahrenheit. Um, we set these up in a cascade design usually. So we'll put two units cascaded together to go from a 38 to 180, for example. Uh, and do the high lift required with super high efficiency from the centrifugals themselves. Um, that extremely high lift in a water to water unit, uh, if done with centrifugals, can ensure that you have super high efficiency. If you do it with other types of um, kind of compressor designs, the efficiency will drop slightly. So we really want to use when we use larger capacities, we're using the centrifugals for that higher efficiency and, and get that lift rate up to 180. Here's an example of heat recovery, similar to those modular units that we were talking about before. Um, and we kind of take from one heating or cooling from one side and, and, and it's a four pipe unit. So instead of being a six pipe, like we saw earlier, you can recover heat and send it somewhere else. Really like small, you can fit it in tight places uh, as well as it can be uh, modularized for, for larger capacities. So uh, happy to, you can take a look at that later if you have questions about it. Uh, all the manufacturers kind of make these products, so it's nothing super uh, crazy. But if there's something specific you have questions about, I'm always to answer uh, them, or you can reach out to a representative for that too. Uh, so looking at uh, heat recovery again, this is one that we use very commonly. It's a RTWD. Uh, in this case, it goes up to 167 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, or about 75 C on the hot water side, and can down to about minus 12 C or, or 10 F. And uh, that obviously in that case wouldn't be water. It's glycol uh, is what we're usually using propylene or ethylene glycol in those designs. Uh, but whatever is required for the system uh, is a pretty nice lift. And these RTWDs we've been using in this chillers uh, for even lower lift applications or make or in ice rinks for, for decades. Uh, we've been using these screw machines for quite a while. 
So very proven design and, and uh, very commonly seen for heating now as well. <clears throat> So the last uh, kind of slide is a product actually kind of originated out of Europe that we're seeing used a lot more now in uh, Canada and a little bit in the U.S. as well. It's kind of growing in the U.S. Uh, it's a high temperature booster, but it can also do really cold temperature heat source. So uh, connecting in really cold um, uh, solutions, for example, looking at uh, ice rinks and moving that right up to like steam, for example. Uh, low pressure steam or we're creating really high temperature hot water uh, we're using these uh, equipment quite a bit uh, pharmaceutical applications for cold climate as well really low gwps those global warming potentials in the refrigerants uh, and then we're also seeing it like auto manufacturing where they need uh, high heat temperatures provided uh, from a heat uh, and then also maybe looking at pulling that from a, a waste source that they need to cool as well uh, or thermal weights, waste. So there are really uh, a lot of benefits there. And, and we're seeing these types of pieces of equipment used a lot more in the last, uh, last few years. Just looking at the refrigerants that we were talking about, I'll keep it really short here because we're running out of time. Uh, but I just wanted to give an example here to look at. Uh, on the left here, low pressure side, green is kind of the refrigerants that we've moved towards. Black is refrigerants that are kind of uh, the past ones and, and orange has been mostly moved out now too. Uh, but really green is where we're seeing low pressure would be your centrifugal type equipment usually. Medium pressure is your screw uh, and some centrifugals, but really mostly your screws usually. We're seeing the blue and the green uh, all being used. These blues are kind of the low units. And what we're seeing down here is uh it's reduced from 134a and r12 obviously in greenhouse warming potential but uh really like only one of those refrigerants is down to one whereas uh here the we have multiple refrigerants down uh that have the same gwp as co2 and then in the high pressure which uh are very common everywhere and in, in, in scroll compressor typed equipment so that would be for example air conditioning unit at a home or uh, any split units, VRF units, uh, rooftop units, et cetera, some chillers as well. Um, we've been seeing the industry move towards two different types of refrigerants, mostly in a little bit of this one. Uh, I would say 90% 454B if the thumb in the air, and then I don't know, maybe 8% R32 and 2% this. Kind of what I've been seeing lately is coming out, but uh, I'm sure it'll continue to change and as people develop more refrigerants and things like that. Um, but really the benefit that we've been seeing here is uh, the GWP and, and we work with mostly our 454B uh, as a generality, but uh, we're seeing that 466 is the lowest greenhouse warming potential over all the other options that are kind of used right now as a major uses. So we've been using that a lot in, um, in our products. Uh, one last example of like another kind of different type of system, which has been really interesting to see is pulling heat from weight company that does it with a few different ones in the market they actually pull heat from the wastewater they send it to uh kind of a through a self-cleaning heat exchanger and, and then clean it and then boost it with heat pumps and then can provide hot water or cold water to the building so it's kind of a good example of uh you can either take it from the building itself or from the like a city wastewater system or anything like that and uh, you can reject heat in the summer to the sewer or to the, the waste source, and then you can pull it and uh, super high COPs. I've seen very high COPs coming from this because the uh, wastewater systems are, are quite warm. And uh, and when the wastewater is warm, you can pull a lot more heat from it in the winter, especially. Uh, here's an example project that just got finished by them. If you want to see kind of examples of savings and stuff like that, I thought that was pretty interesting. So um, showing their slide here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, kind of crazy savings for like a hospital in Toronto, for example. So interesting, uh, example that's happening like right where, uh, where, where I live in Toronto here. So I thought I'd share that as a, as a cool example. I think we're pretty much at time here, Mark. I got one more question and I'm curious what the answer was. So maybe if you can give me the answer for the, for the last one and then we'll ask the last question. Yeah, well, it's looks like only forty percent work with partners, which is a little lower than I would think too. Is is uh, I know, a lot lower. I know you guys uh, um, 
all the provide great information and great help for people um, when when trying to work with with building owners to uh, for their building. So um, take advantage take advantage of, of partners like Train when, because uh, you can get a lot of value out of for sure. I'll, I'll make yeah, the last. Well, obviously, one. feel free to reach it. Yeah. Why don't you put the last one up and then uh, and then yeah, if there's any other questions and stuff like that, please let me know. But uh, I think I'm perfectly on time by the sounds of it. Yeah, you've kind of nailed the time. That's great. Yeah, so Luke's information is, is up there. So definitely feel free to, to reach out uh, with, with any questions or to get some more information. But um, yeah, definitely want to say thank you. I, was, I should chat to see if there's any other questions uh, from the audience. Perfect. Let me know what, uh, I'm curious, the last one when you post it, what the... Uh what the response is right now it's always right, good to know that feedback yeah and it, it, it can depend on the audience too right so we'll see what what uh you know whether you know the topic fit with with the people that came to the event but right now it's it's along the same lines as the help right now it's 40 percent is useful and 60 percent not as useful so um cool but um but we'll see uh, i think it was some great information and what we'll be doing is turning this as well into um to an article for the magazine too for plumbing and hvac um and uh and i think that there's some great information in there so um if that's it and there's no other questions uh and i'll just double check i don't think so um then i'll just say thank you no, no nothing else has come in so we'll say thank you very much for for okay. taking the time today i appreciate it and uh and uh, for anyone else who has any questions, you have Lucas's information. This video will be available um, to watch down the road, uh, like on the site as well for the, for the next month. And then we'll also be put up on our training site, Training Trades. Um, and you'll see uh, see an article in the next issue of the magazine too. So um, thanks again, Lucas, for, for coming. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Great to meet everyone and hope you have an awesome rest of your week. Take care. All right. Thanks.